stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hopwood. 2012 is here, and it promises, if nothing else, to be an interesting year. As we approach the much-talked-about and anticipated end of the Mayan calendar, what events might occur before the December 21st ending date? Speculation abounds from alien contact, earth changes, to the ending of the world as we know it, through war. Not since the Y2K bug has there been so much interest in an approaching year and date. As the year 2000 approached, computer programmers became aware of a potential problem with many of the computers being used at the time. If not corrected, it could lead to problems on January 1st of of the year 2000. The problem stemmed from how the computer read years in its programming. Dates were originally coded with only two digits to represent the year, so once the year 2000 came, the computer would think it was 1900. The fear was that this could cause computer crashes and loss of data. Speculation by some suggested a crash of the banking industries, food supply chains, and the worst case scenario, an unintended nuclear war. If the defense computers in the US or Russia glitched. In the end, no major catastrophes occurred, mainly because the problem had a relatively easy fix. One of three solutions were used. The first was to buy a new computer. All newer computers had corrected the two digit year problem. Second was to go into the computer programming and insert a four digit year code. This would have been done by those industries that could not afford the cost of totally replenishing their computer networks. The third was used by those who wanted to delay having to buy new computers. They simply reset the year in the computer to an earlier equivalent year, buying them time to replace the systems later. The anticlimactic ending to the Y2K bug led some to say it was all a hoax. But not unlike now, the same uncertainty of the future exists as we approach the end of 2012. Economically, the U.S. and Europe are still floundering. The possibility of more economic chaos is very real. But the one simmering issue that has the most potential to fulfill the doomsday scenario of 2012 is the nuclear Iran problem. As Iran gets closer to being able to produce a nuclear bomb, Israel is formulating its options on what to do and when. Over the years, they have done everything they could, short of a preemptive attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. So far, nothing has been able to stop Iran's progress, only delay it. At some point, if Iran doesn't reverse its course, a military attack on its facilities will be inevitable. There is talk of a possible strike this spring or summer. President Obama recently met with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, to discuss when and if the attack should occur. Obama was wanting more time for sanctions and other diplomatic approaches to work. There was also talk of Obama wanting Israel not to strike until after the November elections. He is obviously worried about what the consequences of war could do to his re-election chances. Israel has twice struck at its enemies attempting to harness nuclear power. The first was in 1981. Iraq started its nuclear program sometime in the 1960s. By the mid-1970s, they were ready to expand it by acquiring a nuclear reactor. The Iraqis went to the French. They were unsuccessful at first in acquiring their first choice in nuclear reactors, but eventually they were able to convince the French to sell them a less sophisticated reactor at the cost of $300 million. They were able to purchase a Cyrus-class nuclear reactor with a smaller ISIS reactor. Construction began in 1979 at the Al-Tawatha Nuclear Center near Baghdad. The French named the facility Osirak, a combination of Osiris and Iraq. The Iraqis named it Tammuz I. Tammuz represents a pagan god and a month of the Arabic calendar. The same month Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party took power in 1968. Israel began to prepare its strategies on how to deal with Iraq's nuclear ambitions in the mid-1970s. They knew full well that once you've mastered making nuclear power, it's only a short step to nuclear weapons. Israel had begun its own quest and harnessing nuclear energy shortly after being a nation. Israel, Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, was adamant that Israel obtained nuclear weapons to prevent another holocaust perpetrated against them. 
Never again would be their mantra and driving force. It has been reported that when Israel eventually created its first nuclear bomb, that phrase, never again, was welded on it in English and Hebrew. The Israelis by 1956 would secure the building of the, of the Demona nuclear facility. The French would be their principal partner in construction and helping them develop their nuclear ambitions. The British would also secretly help by delivering uranium and plutonium over the course of the nuclear plant's early years. In 1961, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion informed the Canadian Prime Minister of Israel's int intentions to build a plutonium separation plant at the Demona site. This would allow the Israelis to produce its own fissionable nuclear material. By 1962, the Demona reactor became functional, and by 1965, the, pl the plutonium separation plant came online. At the time of the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel may have had two crude bombs before full-scale production began. Israel to this day does not admit officially that it, has a nuclear, that it has nuclear weapons, but outside estimates indicate that today they have around 150 to 400 nuclear bombs. Israel's nuclear arsenal is the only deterrent that it has to protect itself from getting overrun by the millions of enemies it has in the Middle East. Any enemy state that acquires nuclear weapons would probably eliminate Israel's defense advantage and open the people up to instantaneous large-scale annihilation. When Saddam Hussein began building his nuclear reactor in 1979, Israel felt that something had to be done. Israel tried diplomatic negotiations with France and Italy, the two countries giving Iraq nuclear aid. When that failed to get results, they went to covert actions of sabotage on the project. On September 30, 1980, Iran bombed the Osirak reactor when the Iran-Iraq war broke out. The damage done to the reactor would later be repaired by the French. In October of 1980, Mossad, Israel's intelligence gathering and covert operations organization, reported to Prime Minister Menachem Begin that the reactor would become operational by June of 1981. Israel wanted to bomb the site before it was loaded with nuclear material to prevent any nuclear contamination. Left with a dwindling timeline of action, the Israeli cabinet voted 10-6 to, to launch the attack. Then, as is now, there was a great division on whether or not to attack. The codename given to the attack was Operation Opera. It was also known as Operation Babylon. The raid began on Sunday, June 7, 1981. They started the operation on Sunday in hopes of minimizing casualties. Eight F-16As and six, F and six F-15As were used in the operation. The F-16s would have two Mark 84 2,000-pound delay-action bombs apiece. The F-15s would provide cover support. All the planes had to be modified with extra external fuel tanks to make the 990-mile trip. They also had to navigate through Jordanian and Saudi airspace. They were able to get through unchallenged. By speaking Arabic and pretending to be a lost air patrol from Saudi Arabia when they were in Jordan and a lost air patrol from Jordan when they were in Saudi Arabia. Unknowingly, they flew over the yacht of King Hussein of Jordan on vacation. King Hussein saw the Israeli planes and assumed that Iraq's nuclear reactor was the most likely target. He immediately contacted his government to give a warning to Iraq. Due to a communication error, the message was never received.